And right after me and my siblings finished my sixth grade year, my parents sat us down for a super serious talk. And they basically told us that because of my dad's job, they were moving us from Kansas City, Kansas to Dallas, Texas. If you guys can go back to your middle school years, you can imagine I was devastated. I also was about to get my very serious first boyfriend at that time. So it was, it was a tough blow. Thank you. His name was Kevin. We were, we were about to go so steady. Uh, so I was crushed as a 12, almost 13-year-old girl. Um, but yeah, it was really hard. Um, I was devastated being at a young age. Um, and my parents definitely took us to church some growing up. But I would not say like I had any type of personal relationship with the Lord at this point in my life. And so when we moved, I didn't really have a faith to fall back on. I didn't really like talk to God. I don't ever remember really praying to him at this time. And so when we moved, I just struggled to cope. Uh, I was 12, 13, I didn't really have a good way to cope. And so as odd as it sounds, like to develop a way of coping, I developed an eating disorder, um, which might sound strange to some of you guys. It really did not start from this place of like bodily insecurity. I wasn't insecure about what I looked like. I really just felt super, super out of control of my life and wanted to feel in control. And for whatever reason, kind of counting calories and feeling in control in that way made me feel a lot better. So we moved to Texas. I kind of start this little secret to myself, which I will then keep for the next five, six years. And just some of my most vivid memories of middle school. Like, I think I blocked out most of middle school. I don't know if any of you guys are like that, but middle school is just a little bit of a blur. Um, but some of my most vivid memories are, like, me being 13, like, standing in front of my pantry, like, counting calories or, like, secretly doing, like, 500 crunches in my room each night. Just very unhealthy relationship with my body. Um, but I kept this to myself, allowed it to kind of be my coping mechanism. And then towards the end of eighth grade, my parents sat us down again and said, guess what? We don't think one move was enough. We're actually going to move you guys again. Um, because just moving twice in the middle of middle school, very good for your, your formation as a young person. Uh, so this time they told us we were moving from Dallas, Texas to the great state of Kentucky. Um, and so, yeah, I moved here right before I started high school, um, continued to cope with pain and change and insecurity in this way. Uh, but what's really interesting by the time I got to high school is the best way I can explain it, it's almost like, like what started as just this coping mechanism snowballed and snowballed and snowballed. And by the time I hit about 15 or 16, not only had this become like an area of my life I used to cope, like all of a sudden the insecurity got added on top. And I became very, very insecure and very, very hyper-focused on what I looked like. Like I would just rip myself apart. Um, I also competitive cheered for most of my life, which if there's any dancers or like cheerleaders in the room, you know it's just a great state or great sport um, for struggling with body image. And so, yeah, by the time I hit 16, I just become very hyper-focused with all these things I had wanted to change about myself. Um, and so by the time I hit 18, I actually decided I wanted to get plastic surgery. And I remember taking myself to a plastic surgeon's office in, in Lexington, so nearby here, and just sitting down and telling the surgeon, like, I really do think if I can, like, change this one thing about myself, like, I will finally feel good enough about my body. It'll be good. Um, I just remember telling my friends and family, like, oh, it's just going to be this one thing. But, like, I'd already knew, like, I was going to change, like, two or three things, like, down the road as well. Um, and so I'm sitting in this plastic surgeon's office. We schedule the surgery. And then what's really interesting, it's so fun to reflect back on, like, this specific time period of my life. But this just happened to be the exact same time in my life I started to go to church for the first time and really, like, listen to the gospel. And I actually became a Christian the same time period of my life where I was dabbling with this idea of getting plastic surgery. And so I had scheduled the surgery, and one of the most, like, vivid moments of my life, I am, like, sitting on my parents' deck. I'm 18 years old, and I just started thinking, like, okay, should, should my faith, like, I'm a brand-new Christian, should my faith have anything to do with what I'm about to do? Like, does my faith in Jesus have anything to do with my desire to get plastic surgery? And I, to this day, really feel like it was the first time I ever heard from the Lord, um, and I felt like the Lord said, you know, Kate, if you go through with this, you might hurt your witness to other young girls who struggle with the same thing someday. And so on the faith of, like, a brand-new convert, I was like, okay, I think that's the Lord speaking to me. I canceled the surgery. Uh, I didn't go through with it. What's really cool is I'm, like, five or six years away from ever even thinking about going into ministry, let alone, you know, I spent five years working with middle school girls, now college girls. So it's really cool to see, oh, my gosh, like, the Lord was so right. Um, but, yes, on good faith, I, I did, didn't go through the surgery. And then since that moment, I've just never struggled with insecurity since. Just kidding, it's not that simple. Um, but that was really a big turning point in my life for me. It was a big moment in my faith where I realized, okay, like, 
how does how I view and treat my body, like what does it have to do with my faith? And it was kind of this big turning moment. And then a lot of my 20s um, has been learning to figure out how to answer that question, figure out what health and healing has looked like in this area of my life for me. Uh, It's been hard. It's been hard to like fight for freedom in this area. Slowly learning, slowly getting to a place where uh, I feel like I got a better grip on it. I feel like I understand Jesus' heart for me towards this area. Um, but I share all that. No, it's a lot to just get up here and go straight into. I share all that because tonight we're going to wrap up this three-week series we're in called Under the Rug. And in this series, we've been talking about things that the church and Christians should talk about, but for whatever reason, we just kind of don't want to. We just sweep it under the rug, kind of ignore it. Uh, and tonight, we're going to talk about theology of the body or how, as Christians, should we view and treat our body. And so I want to get up here and kind of show my hand early on and let you guys know this is an area where I've really, really struggled. Um, even thinking back to Brian's week, like this is probably the area of my life I've felt the most spiritual warfare in. Um, and even like thinking about what, what Matt said last week, it was so good last week. Like this is the area where I think about like, okay, like I want to heal this area of my life because what if I have a daughter someday? Like I want to pass something on to her. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to kind of dig in tonight what it looks like as Christians to have a healthy and biblical and holy view of our bodies. So I'm going to spend probably about 10 to 15 minutes. I'm going to walk you guys through three lies that culture tells us about how we should view our bodies. And then we'll kind of talk about what the Bible says, what's the truth that counteracts that. And then we're actually going to do something fun. We're going to end with a little panel uh, with some fun people. So I'll surprise you with who later. But for now, if you're taking notes, we're just going to jump straight in to three lies culture tells us about our bodies. Um, Lie number one I hear a lot from the culture around us is that what we do with our bodies does not matter. What we do with our bodies does not matter. They may be a part of who we are, but we should kind of be able to do whatever we want with them as long as we don't seriously harm anyone in the process. Now, the Bible paints a very different picture of our bodies You know, according to the Bible, our bodies are not just kind of these neutral pieces of matter that we can do whatever we want with. Our bodies, we find in the first few chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1 and 2, it says our bodies are good gifts from God. That God gives us bodies on purpose and for a purpose. They are the very vehicles in which we get to love God and love others. With our bodies, we hug and hurt. We worship and weep. We celebrate and create. You know, we can use our bodies every single day to deepen our relationship with God and others, or we can use them to divide and distract us from the demands of love. So God declares our bodies good, and he wants us to use them to bring him glory, but how we use them is ultimately up to each one of us. Now, not only did God give us bodies on purpose, but he himself took on a physical body. This is important. In the field of theology, we call this the incarnation, which is basically just a fancy top hat way of saying God became human. I love the way John's gospel sums this up. He says um, in, in John chapter 1, he says, The word who is Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling among us. I love the way uh, Eugene Peterson puts it in the message version. He says, The word became flesh and blood, and he moved into our neighborhood. Jesus moved into our neighborhood. He took on a physical body and went through all the stages of physical development just like we did. Like, think about that for a second. Like, think about that. Jesus, just like you guys, grew in his mother's womb. He lost his baby teeth as a kid. I've been thinking about this all week, that, like, somewhere in this world is Jesus' baby teeth. Like, that's a weird thought. Don't think about it for a second. It's odd. He, he went through the ups and downs in the hormones of the teenage years. He experienced sleep deprivation. He belly laughed with his friends. He shed tears at the face of injustice. He took his last dying breath. I love the way um, Tiss Harrison Warren sums up this idea. She has a really good book called The Liturgy of the Ordinary. Shameless plug. It's in the Lewis House Library. You should buy it after this. It's a good read. Uh, But listen to what she says. She says, We Christians believe in a God who by becoming human embraced human embodiment in fullness right down to the toenails. Because of Christ's embodiment, the way we care for our bodies are not meaningless necessities that keep us well enough to do the real work of worship and discipleship. Instead, these small tasks of taking care of our bodies, as minuscule as they are, act as embodied confessors that our creator, who mysteriously became flesh, has made our bodies well and deserves worship in and through our very cells, muscles, tissues, and teeth. So we take care of our bodies because they're good gifts from God. They're the vehicles in which we worship him. 
But what's interesting to me, and this is actually our scripture passage for tonight, is the Bible actually has a farther call on the lives of believers, people who have professed Jesus as their Lord and Savior when it comes to how we treat our bodies. I want to read 1 Corinthians 6 to you all again real quick. Um, It says, don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. Now, this is actually very profound. I think we're very used, especially if you've gone to church um, for a while or listened to a lot of sermons, we're very used to this idea of like, okay, yes, the Holy Spirit dwells in the hearts of believers, but it was not always this easy for God to be this close to us. Like, if you read through most of the Old Testament, you'll realize the great lengths God had to go to set up camp to move into the neighborhood of a sinful people. Like his people in the Old Testament, the Israelites, they literally had to build this super elaborate, like beautiful, ornate temple. And inside the temple was called the Holy of Holies. And it was a super special place that only certain special appointed people could even enter into to stand in the presence of God for just a few minutes alone. Yet because of Jesus, because of what he did on the cross for us, we no longer have to jump through all these hoops and rules and regulations to stand in God's presence. As that verse says, God paid a high price to not only save us, but to set up camp here in the hearts of believers. Which means if you've already accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, like you are a walking temple of the Holy Spirit. Which is crazy. Like just think about that for a second. Or if it helps, like think about it this way. Imagine how you feel if you watch somebody like go up to the Mona Lisa or the Starry Night. I think I have a picture of them, so you can just, like, really envision this. There they are. Famous paintings. Imagine you walk somebody or watch somebody walk up and, like, whip out a pocket knife and just, like, start shredding them to pieces right before your eyes. Like, some of you guys, especially the art majors in this room, or anyone has an appreciation for art, like, you'd probably wince even at the thought because you can't imagine somebody so carelessly damaging something so valuable. And how much more valuable are these bodies that host the Holy Spirit of God? We should hopefully have the same reaction when we commit uh, violence towards our own bodies or towards the bodies of others. And as someone who's um, struggled with an eating disorder for a lot of years, like this, this one hits home with me because once I, again, started to process through, like, what does my faith in Jesus have to do with this area of my life? I started to realize, like, okay, my eating disorder isn't just a coping mechanism. Like, it is that. There's a mental health component. But I started to see it as a form of hatred against my own body. And I really started a process for the first time, like, okay, like, if the God of the universe has called my body good, if he wants me to use my bodies in ways that glorify him and worship him, then who am I to act against that? So what we do with our bodies matter. We're called to take care of our bodies because they're good gifts from God. They're the vehicles in which we love God and love others. So that's lie number one, that what we do with our bodies doesn't really matter. Uh, Lie number two I hear a lot from culture is that, Our image is our identity. Our image is our identity. We should put our worth in what we look like. I feel like I could pop off on this one for a while. I won't because of time's sake. Uh, But you guys know this. Like, we live in a culture that worships the aesthetic. I mean, more than any generation before you guys, you guys have grown up in the age of, like, filters and photoshops and fillers. And, like, every time you hop online and open your phone, whether it's TikTok or Instagram, you're just constantly bombarded with images of the whatever culture at that time is calling the ideal man or the ideal woman. And it can make you feel like you'll never measure up or that your worth will ultimately come from what you look like. That if you could just be that size or wear that outfit or be a little bit taller, be a little bit shorter, that you would finally, finally feel like enough. So if you haven't heard anyone say it in a while, can I just remind you that your worth is not dependent on what you look like. You don't have to be a size zero. You don't have to have a six-pack abs. You don't have to be over six feet tall to be valuable. Your worth is not tied to what you look like. And if someone in your past, I hate this, like, phrase that goes around, that, like, skin or sticks and stones may break your bones, but words never hurt you. I think that's super stupid because I remember, like, everything going back to, like, 10 years old, me, that somebody said to me. Um, so maybe somebody in your past, like, maybe it was somebody in middle school. Maybe it was somebody in a past relationship, like a boyfriend or girlfriend. Maybe it was some random person who commented on your social media posts. I don't know. If somebody in your past spoke something really harmful over you and the way you look, and you've allowed that to carry way too much weight in your life, can we just bind and break that in the name of Jesus tonight? Like, let's just get rid of that once and for all, because your identity is not based on what you look like. Your identity is grounded first and foremost 
in your relationship with God. And I want to be honest, because having a relationship with God will not magically just take away all these insecurities or this pressure you feel to look a certain way, but it will ultimately help you root your life in something so much deeper than that. Uh, Again, this was like really big for me. One of these big aha moments when I was 18 and just started processing this is I just remember having this really big like come to Jesus moment when I realized like, okay, if Jesus like is who he says he is, and if I stand before him someday, like he's not going to be like, good job, Kate. You, like you were the prettiest or the skinniest or like had the most likes on that random post. Like, no. Like he was going to say, hopefully, good job, faithful servant. Like you used your life. You used your body to love others and point them to me. And so having a relationship with God, it's not just going to magically make all those insecurities go away, but it will give you something stronger and more worthwhile to anchor your life to. But your image is not your identity. And then the last lie I want to talk about is that this isn't a spiritual issue. That what we do with our bodies doesn't really affect our faith or our relationship with God. Um, If you're a psych major, you already know this, but the truth is that our spiritual, emotional, and physical health are deeply interconnected. Uh, In fact, one of my favorite stories in the Bible, it's in the Old Testament, is about this guy named Elijah. He's this big prophet in the Old Testament. And He basically at a certain point in history decides to pick this massive fight with these prophets of Baal, um, these, these gods or these prophets from a false religion. And he goes up on this mountain and he calls in the name of Yahweh and basically says, you know, God, can you come through and help me defeat all these prophets of Baal? And God does. He shows up in this mighty, victorious act. Uh, Elijah wipes, wipes all these prophets out and has this huge, massive victory. And it's this really cool moment. And then very shortly after, God comes through for him in this super powerful way. Like, he hits a low, like a low, low. And he starts fearing for his life. And he's afraid that the very people he just went against are going to come and kill him. And so Elijah dismisses himself. He runs away to the desert. And he starts experiencing what can only be described as, like, this deep depression and anxiety. He starts wondering if God's really trustworthy after all. And I love this. God literally sends Elijah an angel who meets him in the desert and takes care of him. But he doesn't take care of him by just, like, saying nice things. He literally gives him food, and then he helps him sleep, and he nurses him back to physical health. And once he's brought back to physical health, like, he's fine. Like, bro literally just needed a snack and a nap, and then he wakes up, and he's like, God is good. Praise God. I'm good to go. Uh, yeah, and if you've ever been, I don't know if you guys ever had this experience. I'm sure you haven't. Maybe you have. But if you've ever been, like, super sleep deprived and, like, your whole life feels like it's falling apart, I see some nods and you're like, this is the worst day ever. Everybody hates me. I hate myself. What's going on? And then you get a good, like, nine hours of sleep and you wake up the next day and you're like, maybe I was the drama. Maybe I just needed a good, a good eight, nine hours of sleep. Or if you've ever been hangry and, like, accidentally just popped off on someone and woke up or gotten yourself a snack and realized it's all fine. You can probably relate to Elijah in this story. Um, But we're that way because we're complex creatures. God made us that way. How we take care of ourselves physically has a really big impact on our emotional and spiritual health. And you see this play out in the New Testament, too. If you read through the Gospels, pay attention to the amount of times Jesus meets the physical needs of the people he's ministering to. Like, he doesn't just go and say spiritual things. He does do that, but he also, like, heals their bodies. He breaks bread and he feeds the 5,000 because he understands the human person. He knows our physical and spiritual health are deeply, deeply interconnected. And so just a piece of advice to you guys, if you ever find yourself in a season where you're feeling super anxious or tired or worn down or just distant from God, like, it's a good place to start to say, like, kind of ask yourself the questions, like, am I sleeping enough? Like, what am I eating? Am I super sleep deprived? It's good to start with those things that could be what's going on, might not be what's going on, um, but it'll help you kind of start to assess, like, is it some physical need I'm not meeting of myself right now? Is that what's causing this? Um, Start there, and then if you're like, okay, no, I'm sleeping well, I'm eating well, I have good relationships in my life, it'll kind of help you pinpoint something else deeper is going on here. Um, But our spiritual, physical, and emotional health are deeply, deeply interconnected, and God made it that way. And so what we do with this area of our life really does affect us on a spiritual level. Um, Okay, like I said, I want to kind of transition out of teaching time, and I actually want to use the rest of our time tonight 
uh, to hear from some other people. Just as I was like praying over this topic specifically, it's just such a broad topic. Um, and more than anything, I think I just wanted you guys to, yes, hear the truth of God's word, hear that our bodies matter, hear what the gospel has to say on this. Um, but I also wanted, to, wanted you to hear the stories of people that you know uh, who have walked through issues when it comes to how they view and treat their bodies. And I wanted you to like hear and know that like God can redeem and heal this part of our lives. So I asked a couple special people to join me on stage. Uh, if you're one of my panel people, you can come up. Yeah, give them a hand. It's, it's nerve wracking. I mean, what legends right here, am I right? Oh, I get a chair, that's so nice. I don't even know. <laughs> I love the, the Steve happening. Not Steven, Steve. We love to hear it. Um, guys, welcome to the stage. Maddie's got our mic. Um, just real quickly, I'm going to have them go down and introduce themselves to you guys. I know them, but want you to get to know them too. So we'll start with Maddie. Tell them a little bit about yourself. Hi, I'm Maddie. I am a sophomore here at UK. Um, I'm a shift group leader. Shout out. Um, and I just, I love the Lord. It's a good summary. <laughs> I am Warren. I am a fourth year here on staff. <laughs> um, and I am on shift team. <laughs> you say it. Yeah. Man, uh, I'm Steven. Steve. There it is. That's good. Uh, I'm a first year. I'm on the men's team. And I also cook a little bit. Shout out to Steve's cooking. We love to hear it. Um, cool. Well, I asked each one of them specifically because I think they each bring a really unique, needed perspective when it comes to how we view and treat our bodies as Christians. Um, and I want you guys to get to hear from them. So to kind of start, I'll just ask you guys a few questions and you can pass the mic back and forth. Um, but when it comes to how you view and treat your body, where have you kind of struggled in this area? Yeah, for me, I, my struggles f were a lot with eating disorder, with anorexia and bulimia throughout um, high school and college. Um, so I kind of always struggled with like body image, I feel like for as long as I can remember since like middle school. Um, and in high school and college, that kind of escalated to, um, yeah, into eating disorders, um, into a lot of anxiety in public settings where I would eat, um, and just all of these things. And I feel like that in itself kind of impacted about, like, I feel like you brought up, like, it impacts, like, every area in your life. So I feel like during that time, like, while my struggle was with eating, with my body image, with how I viewed myself, like, it impacted about every aspect of my life from how I interacted with others to my classes to all these other different areas. So, Can I ask a follow-up question? Please. Yeah, that, I love breaking gender stereotypes. I feel like this one specifically always gets labeled as kind of like a girl issue. And so what was it like kind of processing that as a guy in middle and high school, like dealing with bodily insecurities? It was tough. I felt like it. I was an outlier. Um, so I felt like being an outlier and living in like a, um, I felt like my perspective Growing up, I felt like I had that view of masculinity where I needed to just get over it and do it myself. And being a guy struggling with an eating disorder, it was like I, like I, it was almost like that sense, like I didn't have a sense of masculinity almost. Um, so, yeah. That's good. That's helpful. Same question to you, Maddie. All right. Um, I have a chronic illness. It's called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And that basically means that my body, I was born without enough glue in my body. So essentially my joints are not glued together. They dislocate all of the time. And even when they're not dislocated, it just causes chronic pain. It led to my rib cage collapsing, a whole mess of hospitalizations and chronic pain, and that also means that sometimes you'll see me with a walker or a sling or a cane, and I don't know, it's just kind of, it's kind of funny walking through that starting at age 14 and showing up to school with a walker. So that's been something that's, you know, not something that I've been able to look at any of my friends and relate to. So that kind of led to 
Like, why does God value other people's health and other people's body over mine? Um, through lots of prayer, I've come to conclusions about that one, but which we'll get into later. But, <laughs> but that's where I was, and that's a little bit of my story. And, yeah. That's good. Yeah, I wanted Maddie to hop up here um, because she hits a very different part of this conversation is how do you process your body when you feel like it's broken uh, and, there's, and there's things that don't work the way they should. And that's a whole different type of grief around your body. So thanks for sharing. We'll go to Steve, the chef down there. Steve. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do that. I think that's so funny. Uh, I think for me, honestly, you said earlier, Kate, like, the phrase sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt me is stupid. Mm. Completely agree. Uh, just kind of when I think about like just struggles with my own like image of myself, like just like in middle school, high school, like guys being guys, like like just ripping on each other and whatnot. Like it's just something guys do. But uh, I really took a lot of like those jokes and that stuff to heart and really did affect the way like I viewed myself. Uh, like from an image perspective. And it was something that didn't necessarily materialize itself like outwardly as much as it was like just an inward thing for me that like I wrestled with throughout middle school, high school and like is still like something I'm like, like I've, obviously a lot of freedom and growth has been found there, but still something I'm wrestling with today. Appreciate the honesty. Yeah, which kind of leads us to our next question. Um, and to your point, Steve, like this is not something that you just snap your fingers and it goes away. Um, so knowing you guys have each struggled in different ways, what has it looked like to kind of pursue freedom and holiness in this area? Or even for you, Maddie, like what has it looked like to view your body like through a biblical lens while knowing it still kind of like has issues? But if any of you guys want to speak to that. Yeah, uh, I think... Part of it is, like, this is something that is, like, an ongoing process for me. Like, it's something that I can look back, like, years on and see, like, tangible growth in. Uh, and honestly, a lot of it started, like, when I really came to know the Lord my freshman year of college. But, like, uh, even as, like, soon as, like, last year, like, fully, like, understanding, like, how much God truly loves me. And, like, he's a God that loves me. I'm created in his image. Like, I am, like, his son. Uh, and that is something that's really, like, resonated a lot with me. Uh, I didn't even talk about this before, but, like, uh, for me, a lot of, like, the ways I tried to, like, cope with these uh, just negative feelings and views of myself was, like, working out and, like, just going to the gym, which uh, throughout, like, high school and into college, like, there were unhealthy patterns there, but now, like, thinking about, like, what it looks like to find freedom, like, going to the gym and working out is something that like brings so much life and peace to me. Like it's not something that causes like anxiety or something I'm like having these really compulsive thoughts about like the way I look. Like it's honestly like an opportunity for me to like a lot of times just go in there and like be with the Lord, which is really cool considering that was something that uh, I think the devil did kind of have me wrapped up in years ago, but now something that brings a lot of life and joy. Yeah, Stephen, I love that you brought that up because that's very true in my story too. Just this idea that it really does come down to your mindset because you could be like super healthy and working every day and be completely enslaved to what other people think about you. So I love how you talked about it. Like, it's not that like you've given up these things. It's that you've really learned to see them like in a holy way. So that's good. Warren, what about you? Uh, for me, I feel like freedom, like when I think of freedom, I think I can relate to you a lot of like it is very tangible and I'm thankful that it's tangible. But I think... Um, like, it kind of looked, like, in two different ways almost. Like, the f it was first, like, transforming kind of, like, what I thought of myself and, like, where I found my worth. Um, like, I think in the midst of my eating disorder and those patterns, like, my worth was completely in kind of what other people thought of me, like, what I looked like and almost trying to meet this standard that was physically impossible and just unhealthy. Um, and that kind of is still ongoing, kind of like you said, like the process of that transformation, I would say is still ongoing to kind of, I feel like it's not really like knowing that I'm made in the image of God kind of thing, but it's like almost like taking that in as truth. Like it's like I believe it, but like kind of, yeah, I just feel like I struggle to see that as 
truth almost continually. And then kind of on the flip side, like in the tangible ways, those things have looked like kind of like reshaping patterns of how I eat, obviously. Um, I think one of the biggest ways that I've seen freedom is just like from the, the close people around me, like kind of bringing that like whole masculinity piece up. Like I knew for years that this was something I struggled with and I was just like, I can't let go of it. Um, but it was kind of, it was funny. I was in a social work class and um, we were talking about eating disorders and that like a lot of people don't often, or like often recognize that they have it. And I was like, well, yeah, I know that I have it. And then like something in me that night in my dorm was like, I should just say this, like what the heck? Um, kind of like giving up that standard of like what is considered masculine or not. And I think like those three guys that I told that night, like still to this day, kind of like keep me accountable to some sense. And they're just like, a huge tangible region, the region, reason that I have like grown and have like freedom today. So that's good. Yeah, I love that you invited accountability into it. Um, so I always say you can't heal from what you're not willing to name out loud. So even that step to actually heal or to bring it to the light, let people start to hold you accountable is, is so good. Maddie? What I've learned after years of praying is that from the deep-seated thoughts in my mind of my body is broken and this illness is something that is going to keep me from carrying out God's mission and spreading the gospel the way that I believed God deserved was that my testimony is a gift that God has entrusted in me and that's the same for you. Your story might look different than ours, but the pain of your life is something that God is going to turn for his glory. And in return, you will be so blessed by it. Like God is not giving us these struggles with our body. Like it feels like my body has failed me in ways, but after prayer and just allowing the Lord to come in and show me his hand in my life. I've seen him change my thoughts of like, I'm broken and just my poisoned view of the fruit that I believed he had for my life. And I, I really didn't believe that God could restore the damage that this illness had put on my body. But because my mind was so destroyed by it, I thought like, okay, so the part of me that allows me to walk and be a person and laugh and just like have joy basically. Like I fully, truly it was me idolizing health. Mm -hmm. Truly like health was an idol for me because I looked at my friends and my family and I thought like, oh, okay. So basically their life is perfect and my life is terrible because my body is a mess and theirs isn't. But God has completely restored that. Um, yeah, he promises to restore our youth, and that's just something I've seen him do. And I am not healed. Like, I, maybe I will be. The doctors say that it's not curable, but I don't know if I believe that yet. <laughs> but I've just seen the Lord restore me and bring beauty into my life, and I've seen his hand in my life in ways that I would never have seen if I had lived the typical like standard of health for a 19 year old's life and that's something that I am not willing to trade and it's just like truly given me a deeper understanding of who the Lord is um, it reminds me a lot of Psalm 139 verse 13 um, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb God didn't make any part of your body on accident, and he didn't make any part of your body wrong. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and by allowing ourselves to have destructive thoughts about ourselves, we're just inviting the enemy to throw off the plan that God has for us, but he's not that powerful, and that's something that has truly taken me a long time to understand. And it's something that I have to remind myself often, but that's just really how I've seen the Lord redeem me and 
bring holiness back into this area of my life. Mm, that's good. And then just kind of a follow-up question for you, Maddie. Like, has it, oh, yeah, have you processed the fact that, like, as Christians, you believe that, like, someday our bodies will be fully restored? Like, that is a core belief of Christians, that, like, for people who have bodily ailments, like, someday, like, you will have a perfect body. Have you processed that, or has that changed the way you think about this at all? I think that that's something that I'm probably going to have to think about my whole life, but it's not something that I have to avoid thinking about because that's really exciting. Like, can you imagine getting to heaven and the pain of this earth is just completely gone? Like, can you actually imagine that? Like, they do tell me that I need, I'll, I'll go to doctor's appointments and they'll be like, okay, so you need to do these things and these things, and by the time you're 40, you know, you're going to need whatever, hip replacement or whatever, you know, I don't know. But <laughs> they tell me all kinds of weird stuff. And I just think all the time, I'm like, and I would tell them, I'd be like, how do you know that? Like, I think you're probably wrong. <laughs> but even if they're not wrong, you know what I mean, though? Like, who are they to tell me what I'm going to need? So I just tell them, like, you're probably wrong. <laughs> and even if they are I love that you're right, smiling. I can just imagine <laughs> you smiling as you say no, this to the doctor. No, isn't it funny, though? <laughs> like, how do they know what God is going to do? And God could, I could wake up tomorrow with, like, a fully healed body. I could wake up tomorrow feeling, like, completely fire. But, <laughs> I mean, who knows? I really might. But if I don't, that's okay, too. That used to be a really scary thought that, like, I'm going to have to go through my entire life thinking, okay, tomorrow's going to be painful. Two years from now, I'm still going to be in pain. And that used to be really scary. And, like, still I do struggle with that. But I'm just so grateful because I know that God's word is true regardless of my circumstances. So even if I'm not healed on earth, I will be in heaven. And that's living in the tension well. Like, yeah, it is. I mean, that is living in the tension of, like, knowing we experience pain and brokenness in this earth, but also having hope in something bigger than yourself. So I appreciate you sharing that so much and all you guys. Um, last question. Then I'll let you get off the stage. This is kind of broad. You can go whatever direction you want. Um, but just for the students out there tonight, like, any advice you'd have for them when it comes to how they view and treat their body in college? And Maddie, you can start with you and just go on down. You've all heard that your body is a temple. And that used to annoy me so badly because I would be like, okay, so some people's bodies are a temple worthy of the Holy Spirit, but mine is clearly not because it is broken. You know, I thought like, why is my body worthy of housing the Holy Spirit if it's so broken? But what I've learned is that, and I've also thought like, okay, if I'm not treating my body perfectly, then I deserve this. So what the Lord has revealed to me is if I'm just doing my best, I don't have to be doing it perfectly, but if I'm just trying to honor my body in recognition that it is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, that's enough, and there's grace to cover the rest, you know, I mean, you're not expected to do everything perfectly. We're never called to that. And, I mean, it, it's just too much pressure for us that God never asked us to put on ourselves. And truly, whatever aspect of your body that you feel is broken or unworthy you can give that to the Lord. I know that that seems crazy that you could just give it to him and he would take that. And I'm not saying that it would be an immediate fix, but I am saying that he will take that and he will heal it and he will restore what's broken in you. So I'm really asking that you sit with the Lord in silence and have a moment and ask him, ask him every day. This isn't a one-time thing. This is an everyday submission to the Lord of take this broken area in my life and replace it with your truth because his truth tells us that we are fearfully and wonderfully made and I know that what God says is true and sometimes I don't believe it every day but it's okay to ask God to help you believe it too so 
and also find a community to remind you of these things because sometimes you're not going to believe it because we're not perfect and the enemy is going to try to get in your head and tell you that you are not enough and you're, you're not without the Lord. So you need your friends to hold you up and remind you that you are covered and you are safe. And I don't know. I just think that a community is just truly the most important part of, aside from your relationship with the Lord, of holding you up in that. That's good. Warren, advice? I think some of the best advice I could give for someone maybe struggling with an eating disorder would be that like your eating doesn't have to control you that for me like every meal ended up being um walking alongside like those guys that I mentioned uh holding me accountable and then it kind of like yeah it really did turn into every meal like being a battle almost um of like pretty much just like learning to fuel my body rather than kind of just not eat slash um, binge eat um, and even like having those people beside me. So I think like having people around you and kind of like also just like seeing that like that disorder doesn't own you or doesn't control you and that there is freedom is like some of the best advice I could get. Um, but also like I would say, like, seek professional help as well. I feel like that's um, something that definitely was a huge impact for my walk with an eating disorder was um, going to a counselor. Um, and even, like, here at CSF, we do have a, a key care team who wants um, to just get you connected with that professional help you need to kind of just, yeah, and help you through that process. So, but. That's good. Steve, finish us out. Yeah, I'll try and keep this brief. Uh, thinking about the advice I would have even just given myself like four years ago, like as someone who was very like uh, obsessed with like taking care of my body, like working out, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I was just kind of sitting with the Lord with it today and uh, 1 Timothy 4, 8 came to mind where it talks about physical training being a good thing, but, but training in godliness being even better. And I think that's, that's a scripture, like even reading it today, I was like, ah, yeah, I need to hear that. Because uh, truly, like, while taking care of our bodies is like a good thing, and like, I think that's something like we can do to like glorify the Lord, like, truly, like, in the end, like, these bodies we have here on earth are not going with us, like, thank God. Uh, but while we're here on earth, like, we do have the opportunity to like continue to train in godliness. And even like what Warren mentioned earlier, like, saying, uh, I might have known it in my head, but didn't know it in my heart, like, especially with, like, the way we view our bodies and our identity, like, that is something, like, we can t continue to pursue and train, and it's not necessarily, like, an overnight, an overnight fix, like, for myself, it's still an ongoing thing, but it's something, as I look back and, like, sit with the Lord with, like, I can tangibly see his hand, like, throughout, like, my story, and I know that, like, he's going to continue to lead me in that. That's so good. Uh, can you guys give them a round of applause real quick? <laughs> Best panel. <laughs> so, so good. Yeah, just in, one, it's like really hard to hop up here and just share all that. Um, so one, just give them some encouragement tonight as you see them. But also if like one of their stories really relates to you, like they're going to be around after. Like go find them, talk to them. I'm sure they'll pray with you and uh, answer any questions you have. I'm really grateful for them hopping up and sharing parts of their story. Um, and as we kind of close out tonight, I really just want to end by reading uh, this quote over you guys from Tish Warren Harrison. Um, I just think it sums up what they just said, this whole conversation we've been having about what it looks like to take care of our body. So I'm just going to read this over you guys, um, and then I'll pray, and the band will come back up and lead us in some worship. Uh, but she says, we carry all our bodily training and gathered worship, our kneeling, singing, eating, drinking, standing, hand raising, and gesturing with us into the bathroom on an average day when we look in the mirror. The bodies we use in our worship service each week are the same bodies we take to our kitchen table, into our bathtubs, and under our covers at night. When I stand before the sink, brushing my teeth, and see my reflection in the mirror, I want it to be an act of blessing. I remember that these teeth I'm brushing are made by God for a good purpose, that my body is inseparable from my soul, and that both deserve care. 
Because of the embodied work of Jesus, my body is destined for redemption and eternal worship, for eternal skipping and jumping and twirling and hand raising and kneeling and dancing and singing and chewing and tasting. This is a great mystery. My teeth will be in eternity and are eternally good. When I brush my teeth, I'm pushing back in the smallest of ways the death and chaos that will inevitably overtake my body. I am dust polishing dust, and yet I'm not only dust. When God formed people from the dust, he breathed into us through our lips and teeth his very breath. So I will fight against my body's fallenness. I'll care for it the best I can, knowing that my body is sacred and that caring for it and for the bodies around me is a holy act. I'll hold on to the truth that my body and all its brokenness is beloved and that one day it will be like the resurrected body of Christ, glorious. Brushing my teeth, therefore, is a nonverbal prayer, an act of worship that claims the hope to come. My minty breath, a little foretaste of glory. Let's pray. God, just thank you um, for your goodness. And God, just thank you for the testimonies we got to hear tonight. I uh, thank you for Maddie and, and Warren and Steve and just the way you've worked in their hearts and worked in their lives. Um, I just thank you that they're just kind of, kind of walking models of freedom and hope when it comes to this area. Uh, God, we just thank you for your goodness. And I just want to really echo what Maddie said. Like, we thank you for your grace, that you don't expect perfection from us in this area, and that when we mess up and we fail and we're imperfect, that you're there and, and ready to forgive and ready to meet us with your grace. Uh, God, I just thank you that our bodies are gifts from you. And um, I just pray against any shame tonight. I know this is an area of our life where we can feel a lot of shame, um, but we just pray against that in Jesus' name. And I just pray um, that you would just meet these students in a special way um, and just, just reform the way they see themselves. Help them start to see this area um, of their lives through your eyes. Um, and we just pray that over this next time of worship. We love you so much. You're going to be pray. Amen.